Welcome to this edition of International Geneva. The Kofi Annan Foundation was established by the former United Nations Secretary General in 2008. It mobilizes political will to overcome threats to peace, development and human rights. Today I want to find out how it's carrying on Mr. Annan's work and legacy. Kofi Annan sadly passed away on the 18th of August. How is the organization coping now? Well, you can imagine it was a shock to all of us because it came unexpectedly. And um, he was such a wonderful person. He was not only chairman of the foundation, he was to many of us a mentor, a, a model and a friend. And um, therefore it was difficult to accept that he should have disappeared. So it was a very emotional moment and uh, at the same time a very strenuous time because of course the daily work of the foundation had to continue coupled with the need to help organizing the different events that uh, happened in Ghana, the funeral in New York and in Geneva. So the work for the staff who did a wonderful job was of course extremely, extremely high. Um, now, um, this is over. So now we have to face the future. So, um, the loss has still to sink in, but uh, we now have to focus on what the future should be of this foundation. Mr. Anand's main commitment was to tackle challenges to peace and human security around the world. What legacy is he leaving behind now? Well, for me, I think the, the main legacy is that he has shown that the UN is an organization where many honest people try to work for a better world. Because he was so honest and convincing in his way of presenting problems that he, in fact, represented the organization. You have known uh, Mr. Anand for more than a decade, so you must have a lot of personal encounters and situations that you remember. Which one do you remember the most? What was uh, standing out in terms of inspiration? I had many episodes I could, I, I could tell you. I think the first was when I visited him the first time after I was appointed ambassador to the United Nations. And I went to his office and he greeted me and then he asked, is your first name Yenne, uh, first name from the Jura? And I said, no, it's not from the Jura, it's Hungarian because my mother is Hungarian. But there was a message behind that. And the message was that this was a person who tried to tell me that I was not indifferent to him, first. And second, that he knew Switzerland and its history. So that, that was a very Kofi Annan way of communicating. I wanted to show him Switzerland, so invi I invited him to come to Basel. And we visited the museum, Bailer Museum and others. And then another time I invited him to our house in Turgau. And uh, I said, well, I would like to show you other parts of Switzerland. So let's go to Appenzell. So we went to Appenzell and um, then I said to him, jokingly, uh, Mr. Second General, i sorry to inform you that um, I'm rather sure that the majority of the people you see in the street have certainly voted against Switzerland becoming a member of the United Nations. And then he laughed and said, uh, okay, that's democracy, that's okay, but I'm happy to know that the majority of the Swiss people have voted the other way around. So he was, he was a wonderful person and, and his humor was also great. And how was he recognized on the streets, for example in Appenzell, and how did he react to the people on the streets? Well, in Basel, I tell you, we, we went to see the museum, the Kunstmuseum, and there was a temporary exhibition. I couldn't I mean, he's st I, I wanted to show him this exhibition, but there were so many people who wanted to take a photo with him 
that finally I said, listen, I think I have to um, move with you to the, to the permanent exhibition where nobody was. Um, because people, they knew him. Sometimes they were confused. So at the museum, there was a security person and she came to him and said, oh, Mr. Mandela, <laughs> I'm so happy. To so, you know, there was c this confusion, but people knew that this was an African who was a world leader. You have served on the board of the uh, Kofi Annan Foundation since uh, its establishment in 2008. Yeah. In which direction are you planning to take the uh, foundation now? I think the foundation has to continue. That's, that's, that's obvious. It has to continue. It has to continue to be engaged in the areas which were defined uh, by uh, Kofi Annan. Reconciliation, peace, uh, agriculture, uh, youth, promotion of youth leadership. So this is going to happen. How we are going to do that, we have to think about it. We have to discuss that in the board. But the fact that it will continue, even without the leadership of Kofi Annan, is for me out of question. Are you planning to keep the uh, organization based in Geneva as well, or maybe consider moving it elsewhere? No, I think there is there's, there's, there's no better place than Geneva for, for a foundation like that, because the convening power of Geneva is, is enormous, and uh, uh, therefore I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't imagine a place where we should move to. And the networking, of course, is very important absolutely, also for uh, donors, etc. Right. Now, you are a career diplomat, Mr. Stellin, and you also negotiated the ascension of Switzerland to the United Nations in 2002. How will your experience shape the organization and uh, your new role? I think I know the UN a little bit, which is helpful. I think I know Geneva a little bit, and I know Switzerland. You're a very modest person, uh, Mr. Stalin. No, but the most important thing probably is that I think I know what Kofi Annan's vision was. And therefore, my aim is to seek to see that this vision continues to be part of the mandate of this foundation. In just one or two sentences, what was his vision apart from contributing to peace and stability and human rights in the world? Well, I think uh, these are, are, of course, the main, uh, the main um, <coughs> uh, items. Um, peace, sustainable development, human rights. And then, in addition, uh, one thing he, he always uh, found very Im important is youth leadership. Um, I remember uh, one of his sayings when he said, you are, you, are, you are never too young to be a leader. And then he added, and you're never too old to learn. And uh, he never stopped learning, he did never he? never stopped learning. When it comes to uh, peace building, the uh, foundation in the past has criticized uh, practices in war-torn countries to bring back and establish peace and mediate and conflict resolution as well. What kind of counter solutions should be brought and uh, set in place? Well, I think there is no unique solution. Um, but I think what we need is to understand that every situation is different and that you have to understand the complexity of a situation and also the history and the culture and that you have to listen before you come with proposals. And that should happen in any conflict, right? Uh, Syria, happen. for example, would be a prime example as well for absolutely. that. Absolutely, absolutely, which is a messy situation as you as you well know, the very difficult situation and also that when you try to help bring forward peace, it's not only important to understand the situation, but it's also timing is also important and the willingness of all the actors that are involved. Because without in a situation like uh, Syria of the permanent members of the Security Council and the main powers within the region, you have no chance of, you know, being successful. 
the foundation has been very active also in electoral processes, for example, in Africa, um, especially to avoid any post-electoral violence and bring back stability to certain uh, countries. Uh, now, this year we had or we will have elections, crucial elections coming up, um, for example, in the DRC, we had in uh, Zimbabwe, in the DRC, etc. Do you see any progress being made there in terms of electoral uh, processes and elections, the way they are conducted? <laughs> you know, Kofi Annan used to say, I'm not optimistic, but I'm hopeful. And I think um, that is a, a, a good motto. Uh, Africa is a continent. Uh, so the situation is very different from one country to the other. I think Western Africa is probably the part of Africa where you can say that some successes have been achieved. If you just think of Sierra Leone, but there are there are there are other 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 cases, um, Angola, I think, um, Botswana. So um, the important thing is democratic elections, and then of course to avoid that uh, a democratically elected leader certainly at, uh, at the most certain moment thinks, well, you know, um, why should I have another election so that um, he, he turns into, into a dictator. Africa is such an amazing continent, uh, but still some figures are just staggering. It is an agricultural powerhouse, for example. 60% uh, of the world's um, uncultivated arable land is in Africa, so it would be enough to basically cover the needs of the continent, even maybe to export some of the surpluses. What needs to change in this uh, dynamics? One has to understand that Small farmers are in a certain way entrepreneurs. And you have to help them, as you have to help in, in, in our part of the world, an entrepreneur to be more effective and therefore also more successful. Which means that you have to give him the possibility to learn, but you have also to give him the money, uh, the good seas, instruments. And then, as you have mentioned, I think um, it is important that they have the that these countries understand that intra african trade also of agricultural products is important and then in addition to all of that of course there need it is there is a need for government action when it comes to the effects of climate change uh, to allow farmers to be informed on the weather forecast, um, eventually to have an insurance system put up. I think all this would help slowly to improve the outcome of um, agricultural products in Africa. And it's always the same issue, right? Inclusion as well. But uh, it's scary how the blockchain development, for example, or new technologies are again happening in many developed countries. And there seems to be an increasing digital gap and divide again with a continent such as Africa. Yes and no. But you know, the interesting thing is, if I'm correct, I think I am, that the number of um, iPhone users in Africa is staggering high. This is the way they communicate, which is very interesting to know. Of course, the internet does not function the same way as it does with us, but the iPhone is, is the, 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 the means of communication, much more so perhaps than in other countries. In terms of priority areas for the foundation, because Mr. Anan came from Ghana, do you have a special focus on the continent now going forward? I think we have to continue to focus on, on Africa because for, for the reasons you mentioned. First, because it's the region Mr. Anan comes from. Secondly, because it is a continent that needs, uh, needs uh, support. And uh, that there is already a network of, uh, of institutions with whom we work, like AGRA, uh, the uh, institution that tries to promote agriculture in Africa. You mentioned uh, business partners as well and partnerships and the network, which are some of the most important partners, maybe here in Geneva or worldwide, that you're hoping to work with now. I think we have to continue um, the way Mr. Anand worked, but of course his convening power was exceptional. 
But I remember the first time I was with him in Davos, by the way, uh, he launched the idea of the global compact between business and the United Nations. So he was always convinced that civil society, and I include business in civil society, play an important role in whatever we do at the United uh, Nations. So um, he also had this idea and put it into practice in, with the help of Mr. Schwab to have those Davos dinners amongst um, uh, business people, potential investors in Africa and representatives of African government. And I think we should try to, uh, to continue to work in that, that direction. And there seems to be such a strong will and power as well from the private sector and businesses because of this impact investment boom to really work with foundations like yours. Yeah. And you know, when you talk to some people like, and one member of our board, by the way, is, is Carlos Lopez, who used to be the um, uh, representative of the United Nations in Addis Ababa with the African Union and at the same time head of the Economic Commission for, for Africa. And he, you, and he is, is convinced that the potential in Africa for business is, is enormous. But, you know, you have to find the right way and, 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 and the right people. Thank you so much for your time, Mr. Stelling. Great Thank pleasure you seeing much. you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.